welcome to you all to today's online debate. I hope you all have, passed, have spent a nice summer despite the situation. So the seminar today is again organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance, and the topic is mitigating the impact of COVID-19 on the insurance and occupational pension sectors in Europe. So we are changing sectors in a way, but we're not changing the main topic, which is still the COVID-19 crisis. So my name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of finance at Bocconi University, and I will be chairing the debate today. So let me start by welcoming the speaker. We are very happy to have with us Gabriel Bernardino, who is, as we, we all know, the chairman of Ethiopia. Then we have two commentators. The first one is Professor Roel Betma, from, uh, who is a professor sorry, of pension economics at the University of Amsterdam and is also the vice dean of the Faculty of Economic and Business there. And then we have Giuseppe Corvino, who is a professor of financial markets and institution at the Bocconi University with a vast experience in the private sector, also full time. So thank you for the, to the three speakers for joining us today. So the way we, we are going to organize the event is the first we have Gabriel giving a 15, 20 minute uh, introductory remarks on the effect of COVID on the pension, uh, um, uh, I mean, on pension funds and insurance companies, and the lessons that we can already draw from this. And then we will have the two commentators, and we decided, Giuseppe, when you were not there, that Roel would go first, and you will go second. And I remind that each of you has five to seven minutes. So concerning participants, as you know, you are welcome, very welcome to ask questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Please try to ask a brief question, possibly with the name of the person you want to address the question to. We have already received a number of questions from the participants that I will post. And without further ado, given the short time we have, the floor is now with Gabriel. Please, and thank you again for being with us. Well, good afternoon to all of you, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Carletti, for the invitation and for the opportunity, and congratulations to you uh, to put this in place. I think it's very important that uh, in this period we can continue to have this type of engagements. So uh, I will try to, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about the implications of COVID-19 in, in the sectors and, in, of course, in supervision. And uh, as we all know, of course, uh, this has been one of the most uh, disruptive events, uh, I would say, of our lives. And, uh, and the impacts are far-reaching uh, with implications in everything, the way we live, the way we work, the way we do business, but also the way we do supervision. And what started as, uh, and that continues to be, uh, let's be honest, as a health crisis rapidly uh, escalated, causing a lot of disruption to, to people's households, finances, and also overall to the, to the economy. And we all had to adapt, and that's the reality. From an insurance uh, supervisory perspective, uh, all our actions have been centered, I would say, on three main priorities and objectives. Number one, to ensure at the early stages of the crisis that, uh, that there was a business continuity. Secondly, to ensure that the stability of the sectors and thirdly, to mitigate uh, impacts on, on consumers. And let me go along the lines of these three areas. So firstly, on ensuring business continuity. We have done that at both at supervisory level because all the national authorities and also EOPA, we, we quickly started remote working, you know, putting an emphasis on the safety of our staff, uh, you know, putting in place contingency planning, adapting governance structures, uh, video conferencing, working and still, of course, uh, you know, uh, being ready to, um, to, you know, to have our role, of course, fulfilled. But also, uh, we contributed to, to the fact that the, mar the market would need to be fully operational and focused on, on, on serving consumers uh, by, of course, uh, putting in place a number of measures to alleviate the burden, especially on the reporting uh, on the reporting side. And this, I think, was achieved. The outcome, I think, is very good. We, we, we don't have a description of any major disruption in insurance services. There was a quick adoption of uh, new technologies. Everybody's going more digital. And so in that sense, I think this first part of ensuring business continuity has been a success. Secondly, on ensuring the stability of the market. And in here, I want to make a reference of a number of items. You know, first of all, 
The stability of the market, it's not only an issue of micro stability, it's also an issue of macro stability. And so on the micro side, we were very closely following and, uh, uh, and overseeing, of course, the solvency, the liquidity of the different uh, uh, participants in the market. And having, of course, uh, you know, a huge engagement with national authorities, uh, we, you know, increasing the monitoring, uh, collection of information, sensitivity analysis, the fact that we have now data, a centralized database of all the insurers throughout Europe, allows us to do, of course, also this uh, sensitivity analysis. We increase the monitoring of liquidity risk, for example, and uh, you know, until now we don't have the materialization of that uh, that risk, but it's important that we continue the monitoring, but also looking at the more macro side. Uh, of, it, of, of this because the role that insurers play overall in the economy, uh, it's very important. And so it, it was fundamental to ensure that insurers can continue to play a more counter-cyclical role uh, during the crisis also. And of course, there are a number of important elements in this, you know, insurers overall entered the crisis with a very robust capital position. And this is, I think, very important. And it's a, a tribute to the work that was done in you know, numera, number of years with the implementation of Solvency II, a risk-based uh, capital uh, nature that, of course, uh, makes sure that there is sufficient capital to absorb losses within a certain type of you know, confidence level. We all know the 99.5 one-year time horizon. And I think this is very important. So we started in a, in a robust and good position overall. Then also, Solvency 2 is already designed with tools to adjust to the short-term volatility, be it in the equity markets, be it on in terms of interest rates, in the spreads, etc. We have the volatility adjustment, we have the dampener and equity risk charges. So the, the design of the regime already caters for uh, these kind of uh, extreme periods of volatility. And also, as you know, Solvency 2 has two capital requirements. So uh, an upper capital requirement based on risks and uh, a minimum capital requirement, which is the where supervisors need to take action to protect consumers when things go really, really wrong. And in between these two capital requirements, there are a number of, uh, I would say, flexible possibilities for the supervisors uh, to, uh, to use uh, uh, during the supervisory process. You know, there are recovery periods when, uh, when there's a breach of the solvency capital requirement. AOPA can uh, issue a statement if there are adverse developments out there in the market that will allow to extend and even this recovery period. And since the beginning of the crisis, so we were very clear and we, you know, we published a statement very early days, ensuring uh, and giving clear recommendations uh, to the way that supervisors should use this flexibility in the regime in a consistent way. And also making sure that not only insurers, but also supervisors avoid pro-cyclical uh, uh, pro attitudes and avoid pro-cyclical consequences. And I think all of these at the end of the day, made possible that we maintain the regime very stable during the crisis until now. And I think this is a huge value. We didn't have the need, as it happened, for example, on the banking side, as you know, to come with adjustments right now during the period of the crisis. So at least until now, the regime proved to be capable to deal you know, with the, with the, the situation that, uh, that, that we had. But of course, the, the crisis, uh, you know, it's a huge challenge uh, to, to, to insurers. And, 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 and it started, of course, as a health crisis. It's transformed in an economic crisis. And it really challenges the overall business model of insurance. You know, if you look at uh, the market volatility with the spikes that we have seen end of March, and of course, uh, the huge volatility that we have seen in, in, in equity markets, the fact that uh, we have now more than ever the low for long scenario there on interest rates and uh, the massive interventions from, from central banks, of course, make it very clear that this low for long will continue. And this is a huge challenge for insurers, but also on the liability side, because of course, a crisis like this, with a pandemic uh, going on, uh, is already you know uh, you know modeled within the uh, within the, the the modeling of of insurance risks, but the modeling of insurance risk in a pandemic scenario it's usually focused on what on mortality and on health on on health insurance and so that was what was expected from a capital claims perspective. What changed during the crisis was that, of course, with the lockdowns that governments had uh, to put in place, then uh, the, the logic of the liability side of insurance changed completely because what started to be threatened, it was, of course, event cancellation, travel insurance, business interruption, and this is more on the property and casualty side. And so this is a completely different type of claims expenditure and a challenge in this area.
but also the crisis changes the business model of insurers because of course you know the effect of gdp contractions uh, the unemployment that is out there this is also very challenging for for insurers so we have a period of uncertainty uh, we don't know when this will end uh, how much this will have an impact on economic uh, grounds and and you know overall there is a question that we pose ourselves as supervisors you know is this a black swan is this something that goes beyond the one in 200 uh, uh, you know, scenarios that we have with insolvency too? And that is something that I think uh, 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 you know, prompts us definitely to issue uh, statements, for example, in terms of te please uh, have a temporary suspension of dividends to preserve capital positions to ensure that you can continue to preserve your counter-cyclical role also in the markets. Overall, I think this worked reasonably well, but let's be honest, there were some differences and approaches by different uh, market players, by different supervisors also, which is not good. This is an issue. I think it's a lesson that we need to take from the, the situation. And this is very clearly due to two things. One, it's the lack of powers of national authorities to, uh, you know, to enforce this. And second one, the lack of powers of EOPA to ensure to enforce that there is a, car, a common outcome throughout the European Union. So I think this is a lesson that we need to take very seriously. Finally, on my third point, mitigating the impacts on consumers, we were very clear since the beginning of the crisis, you know, a number of messages, statements from our side, a lot of engagement with the industry. Please exercise flexibility, be clear in terms of the coverage, assess your products, uh, uh, assess uh, if there's any unfair treatment that is uh, going on due to the impacts of the crisis, implement remedial measures. This is fundamental for the trust in the sector, I think, and that I think uh, it has been also, I, I think, quite positive. Now, to finalize uh, lessons, I think there are a number of lessons that we can start to take, but uh, let me take just two. Um, first one is going digital. And I think that this is uh, clearly a, an outcome also of this crisis. We see digitalization adoption across the uh, insurance value chain to inc increase you know, tremendously. This uh, goes from product development, design, but also in terms of uh, the marketing practices, claims handling, everything is being affected in the insurance value chain. This can be good if of course provides better services and better products, but also brings risks. And we are of course now already more focused on looking at risks like cyber resilience, because that is of course a fundamental one, but also on the ongoing digital and, and taking advantage of more and more data that exists in the way that we live nowadays, uh, all the time linked. The ethical use of data by the insurance sector is a fundamental element going forward. And I think it's also something that will come definitely uh, after this crisis. We're looking at new business models, uh, digital platforms, digital ecosystems. This I think is gonna be the new reality also that was already there, but it's gonna be, I think, very much pushed by the, by, by the COVID crisis. And the second big one is the, I think the attention that the crisis brought to the resilience gaps, to the protection gaps that we have in our society. What happened with the, the pandemic risk coverage is definitely not optimal. You know, we, we've seen now, we see now a lot of litigation in relation to contract clauses. Uh, some of them were clear, many of them were really not clear, uh, especially in business interruption, there is a need really to make sure that there is an understanding of what is covered or not. And the role of insurance overall, dealing with this kind of more systemic risks, uh, uh, I think it's something that needs to be uh, worked upon. At AOPA, we have published recently a paper on what we call shared resilient solutions with some ideas and proposals on how can we use also the insurance sector as a contributor to have better solutions to the resilience of the society. It's not a silver bullet. There are risks which are systemic, which uh, it's not insurers that can, uh, of course, at the end of the day, uh, weather this alone. There needs to be public-private uh, engagement in this. That's why we call these shared resilient solutions. But it's, I think, fundamental that not only for this pandemic risk and specifically for business interruption situations, but also looking forward to other type of systemic risks like cyber systemic risk, like uh, uh, not natural catastrophes uh, that are out there and that will be of course increasing the risk with climate change. We need to have solutions as a society and insurance can and should be part of this, uh, of this, uh, this solution and not be part of the problem as I used to say uh, 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 right now. So in conclusion, we are still in the crisis. We should not forget about that. There's a lot of uncertainty still out there. 
when there will be a vaccine, is there going to be a vaccine? Do we need more lockdowns? What will happen to the economic uh, impacts? Uh, what will happen to the fiscal, when the fiscal and monetary policies will be taken out? Uh, what will be the effect of these on defaults, on credit downgrades? And these, of course, will have a huge implication of in, in the insurance portfolios. What will be the reaction of the financial market to this? What will be the impacts on NPLs in the banks? And of course, we all know the interrelationship that exists between banks and insurers. So a lot of uncertainty is still, still out there. But uh, in conclusion, by and large, I believe that uh, until now, the regulatory and the supervisory framework in insurance was capable to maintain the stability of the sector. But of course, all, I think all this forward-looking perspective that Solvency II brought in in relation to uh, deal with risks, I think it was a very much important element in, the, in that. I think we showed as industry, but also as supervisors, that uh, we have the capacity to adapt and to adapt also quickly, but also not panic. We really to maintain the stability of the sector as a very important element. And I think all of this bring me to my final comment, which is to really uh, understand and believe that insurance can be an important element in the recovery that, uh, that, that we have. We heard today uh, uh, the the president of the commission to you know talking about you know the new impetus for europe and how we can you know go for growth and talk for the recovery i really believe that insurance can be part of this in a number of ways you know through more long term investment more sustainable investment the link to the green deal is clear i think that uh, this can be done in a way that is, I think, a virtuous cycle also to bring better returns in the long term for customers in a more transparent, in a more digital way. Uh, so I think insurance can also say, be a partner increasing the resilience uh, in our societies. But for all of that, uh, insurance needs to continue to maintain a sound capital solvency position and maintain the trust and the confidence in consumers. And that's what uh, I think we have been trying to put on the table and try to make sure that it happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a very uh, interesting and uh, somehow, I mean, full of ideas that I'm sure we will cover again in the discussion. So now before uh, opening the floor for uh, general discussion, we go to the commentators. So first is Roar that will bring us a little bit to the pension uh, system, given that you focus mostly on the insurance companies. Please. Yes, so, so thank you very much, uh, Elena. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I think I can. Um, so I want to structure my comments um, in the following way, and I think I, you know, it's very closely connected what uh, Mr. Bernardino said uh, in his speech. Um, what is the effect of the crisis on pension funds? So I'm looking at the pension fund sector, and then, but also vice versa. So what have pension funds, what can, have they contributed in a way to maybe mitigating the crisis and how can we go forward? And so basically, um, you know, how can they contribute to the investments that also, uh, for example, the European Commission is calling for, uh, like climate investments. So let me just uh, first discuss the effects of the crisis on pension funds. Um, then it's useful to always distinguish the assets and the liabilities. If we look at the asset side, then of course, equity holdings took a hit, but I think the, they largely rebounded. Um, we have also, of course, uh, debt on the on the uh, asset side, um, uh, you know, corporate debt, but also government debt. I think, you know, the debt side or debt was supported by uh, by the central bank's purchases. Um, so that that has helped, obviously. Um, you know, other items which may be a little bit smaller, like real estate, is of course an, an issue. And commercial properties have fallen in value uh, and all that. And um, when we look at uh, derivative holdings, typically in, you know, like in Dutch pension funds, um, which is, you know, in terms of, you know, the pension funding industry is quite large, is, uh, you know, the derivative holdings interest swaps, which of course rise in value when interest rates fall. When we look at the liability side, then typically what have been the effects depends on the type of contract. Yeah? So, under defined contribution, we of course have that liabilities by definition equal assets, but under defined benefits, like is the case for most pension funds in the Netherlands, we see that falling interest rates 
that they reduce the discount rate at which future payouts are done. So they blow up the liabilities. And this effect dominates the effect on the, usually dominates the effect on the, on the asset side. So overall, falling interest rates is not good for uh, defined benefit pension funds. Going a little bit further on the liability side, uh, some people have been saying, yeah, I mean, so, you know, COVID-19, many people, uh, you know, there are many casualties as this affected liabilities of pension funds. And I think generally the uh, view is that this is not really the case. Um, of course, there are many casualties, but many of the people who, um, many of the casualties are people who had you know, old people who had low remaining life expectancy. So in terms of liabilities, probably not so much has, has changed from that side. Um, actually, the Dutch Actuarial Society recently, one or two weeks ago, updated life expectancy. They actually revised down life expectancy compared to earlier projections, but they did not take into account the effects of COVID-19 because they were too uncertain. Now, I, um, I found very interesting what was being said about uh, the IOPA guidelines for occupational pensions. And um, one of the issues, and that was, I think, you very clearly pointed out also in uh, Mr. Bernardino's, what he, he said was that, well, first of all, pension arrangements differ widely across countries, but then it's, of course, the national authorities that are in charge. And, you know, they may, um, they may use very different responses. So I think here IOPA is a little bit in a difficult position because they can, you know, mostly give very general guidelines. Um, so one of them, which is also, which was also, uh, you know, used a lot in the case of the Netherlands, flexibility in the collection of contributions. But of course, I mean, you cannot, cannot endlessly postpone these contributions. And, Employers may go bankrupt, etc. So, I mean, there's, there's a trade off here. And there are many other uh, you know, guiding principle, principles that make sense, but there are two, I think, quite important ones, and that is the careful monitoring of the national authorities of funds' liquidity positions. Um, especially, uh, you know, you need to have enough liquidity to maybe fulfill marginal requirements, uh, you know, on your derivatives and to monitor the poor cyclical effects. I will say something about that because it is quite important and especially it is important for defined benefit uh, pension arrangements. So let me look at it from the other side. Um, um, so, so I was telling you about the effect of the crisis on pension funds, but I can also look at it from the other side. So what can pension funds contribute to the economy in these circumstances? First of all, we have to realize that pension funds, they, um, you know, they have long run liabilities, but they cannot borrow normally. I mean, only to, you know, to, to bridge some cash uh, shortages. So they are inherently stable when you compare them to, uh, to banks. Yeah, so they cannot borrow to speculate, not take these deposits. So they are not subject to bank runs. Um, and they often have, at least in, the, in, in, in my country, I'm a supervisor of one of the major pension funds. You know, we have a strategic asset allocation, which means that if stock markets fall relative to other markets, you would, in principle, go into the market and uh, recover the share of uh, investment and stocks that you have. Yeah? So you would actually, this way, you would stabilize the market. But there is what I was just telling you, the pro-cyclical effects, which are quite important because, um, so, so the, uh, I mean, from, from the asset market perspective, the pension funds, they can be quite stabilizing, but they could be, you know, somewhat destabilizing on the macro economy. And we have, especially with defined benefit pensions, we have a fall in pension coverage ratios precisely during the crisis, which may stimulate voluntary saving. So, you know, have a further negative effect on the economy and typically defined benefit plans needs to be restored. So the restoration through higher pension contributions, et cetera, may actually also, uh, you know, uh, be a drag on the macro economy. Um, 
Some other perspectives, when we look at the way forward, there is a need for investment, investment out of the crisis, uh, I'm almost done, uh, investment out of the crisis. And the good thing about pension funds, and I think also the life insurance industry, their liabilities are very long run. So that means that they are ideal investors in illiquid long run assets like infrastructure, maybe also real estate, mortgages, but also climate technology. Um, so I expect, um, you know, from that side, you know, there's a lot of investment potential. Um, one of the discussion points, but I'm not a specialist in insurance, but I still want to bring it up, is um, okay, capital buffers are, of course, important, but how strict do you need to be with regard to the risk that, you know, can be run? Because if you demand too much certainty, then of course there is less scope to invest in those long run, maybe illiquid assets. And that may be, uh, you know, in equilibrium, in macroeconomic equilibrium, may have an effect on, uh, you know, on the economy, on the, on the growth potential of economies. Quite interestingly, um, I don't think you mentioned this in your speech, but in your, in, you know, in the text that I saw, you were mentioning the personal pension product, uh, the pan European personal pension product, which is, I think, from a macroeconomic perspective, is a very interesting and also important item because it, you know, it, it enhances job mobility. Uh, it, it, well, it reduces the cost of moving to other jobs and maybe also to move to a job in another country, but. I think it also raises questions because how does it, so, so, so two major questions, how does this stack up against the requirement of mandatory pension participation that we have in some countries? Uh, so would that not be on the mind? And um, the other is if consumers can just take their pension anywhere they like, what does this imply for pension funds? Do, are they forced to invest shorter term more liquid assets in order to you know to have the money ready if a person takes it to go to somewhere else so i mean there's a, there's some trade-offs here but i see <laughs> i think you know we can we can discuss this so let me conclude and thank you for your uh, attention thank you Raul. let me go straight to giuseppe given the time and please stick to no more than seven minutes uh, thank you for inviting me here today to comment on Mr. Bernardino's speech. First of all, I need to thank Mr. Bernardino de Iopa uh, for their commitment on Solvency to Project. I think that from an industry and client perspective, the S2 regulatory framework has done its job. The risk-based uh, capital buffer built in with Solvency 2 helped a lot to ensure to withstand uh, the unexpected market shocks experienced with COVID-19. We don't need to think of the former regulatory framework solvency well. Fully unlinked for any kind of risk factor. With this in mind, I'd like to focus on a technical point that I think must be necessarily addressed by regulation, the new rates environment. A very low interest rate environment is one of the most important source of systemic risk for insurers and clients as well for the coming years. Given that the monetary conditions in the Euro area are likely to remain easy to the, for the coming, uh, coming years. Just to focus where we are, I, I'd like to uh, sorry, may, may I share my screen? If... Yes, now you will be able to do it. Yeah, thank you so much. Today we are here. In here we have different rates. Italy, Germany, France, Spain. If we focus starting from September, 10, September 20. We are living a very low environment, starting from mid-19, we are experiencing negative rates, which is a, a totally new normal, total, 
totally new environment. And if we take a look, to perspective, so we stop share in here. Such an environment. I, I don't know, I, I cannot change, but it doesn't matter. Okay, here. If we look at the, in here, we have the bound term structure negative, even though it's uh, focused on third year of maturity. And if we look at the shape of the curve, we may assume that we are living a long-term negative low uh, rates environment. What does it mean that? Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, as widely acknowledged and clearly explained by, uh, I think, uh, very interesting uh, paper uh, prepared by IOPA. I, I think this is a milestone uh, for the next years. Low negative interest rates uh, also have negative side effects, uh, I have to say. Persistent low interest rates affect insurance in different ways. ways. On the liability side, they lead to an increase in undertakings obligation in present value given that insurance liabilities are discounted using the risk-free rates as a basic, so historically positive. This may lead to a significant deterioration, deterioration in the insolvency position. On the asset side, declining interest rate lead to positive change in the value of the portfolio, which depend on the share of fixed income asset, of course. The evolution of spreads and the dynamic of the equity markets. At the same time, low interest rates also lead to a decrease in the interest income and an increase in the reinvestment risk of assets. This has an adverse impact on the profitability of the undertakings and may put at risk the commitment with policyholders in case undertakings are not able to honor them. In a proactive low interest rate environment, undertakings face a significant challenge in terms of finding sufficiently good quality yielding assets to invest. Most of the EU, European government bonds experience negative real yields and some maturities do at fly to quality. This may lead to shift in the asset allocation toward higher yield assets, which are also riskier. For example, low weighted and less liquid assets increasing the overall risk of the portfolio. This trend is commonly known as search for yield behavior. This could increase the risk on the asset side on the balance sheet if the investment risk exceeds the risk bearing capacity of the insurers. Nonetheless, it should be acknowledged that the solvency to framework is a risk-based framework where the risks of investment are reflected in the capital requirement. In addition, in case there is a sudden rise in yield due to rising credit spreads, insurers would suffer immediate loss in their fixed income investment portfolio, which may be offset by low value of liabilities depending on the evolution of risk-free rates. The sharp increase in yield in yields may trigger an increase in lapses and surrenders potentially leading to liquidity constraints triggered by policyholders that may want to profit from higher interest. EOPA is perfectly aware of that. I, I, just, I was just quoting the exceptional paper. So the question is, what to do now? And that's the question. In the first instance, uh, I need, we need a work for the review of the regulatory framework of the solvency to regime, uh, which is particularly important. Revision of the solvency framework, which can uh, affect in 2016, will necessarily have to take into account the completely new normal economic conditions in which the European insurance market operates, particularly the persistent low and negative rates environment. That I, I'd like to repeat, we are experiencing 
starting from one year. The areas uh, that did not function as expected must in, within the uh, Southern Institute framework, uh, framework must also be reviewed. These include the risk margin in the determination of technical provisions, so as to penalize longer term liabilities, which is the core business, uh, the, the core help that the insurance sector is able to provide to the community of citizens, long-term guarantees measures to mitigate the short-term volatility of the capital requirement and the calibration of certain risk models. The strongest sudden fluctuation in the solvency ratio during the, the different stages of the crisis was affected by the in inadequate functioning of the volatility adjustment mechanism. Indeed, despite the limited intervention in 19, further changes, I think, are needed, which relevant stakeholders are working on at European level to make it more effective. Without appropriate measures, the ability of the industry to continue to offer long-term products and strong support to the European Union and the very role of insurance companies, institutional investors could suffer. I'm sure that the postponement of the Europe's techno technical opinion to the European Commission on the reform project will make it possible to assess the soundness and the assumptions underlying the revision of the regulatory framework, also in light of the impact of the pandemic. In recent months, it has also become clear that the tools provided under the Solvency II framework are, I have to say, inadequate to deal with totally unexpected emergency situation quickly and effectively. As widely requested, insurance industry and clients need to define a limited package of measures at European level, at the higher European level that can be promptly activated in the event of a generalized and totally unexpected crisis, and which can temporarily mitigate the volatility and automatism in our end regulation in order to avoid procyclical effects. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I see that the, the two commentators have not been as well disciplined time-wise, which means that now we don't have too much time, but I would still like to very much open the debate and maybe first leaving Gabrielle responding briefly. But let me say on Solvency 2 in particular, there are a number of questions, not only in line with what Giuseppe was saying, how Solvency 2 should somehow, or we may want to adapt the Solvency 2 to the new Lira situation, but also in response to the COVID-19. So some participants are asking whether Solvency 2, although as you said before in your remarks, helped in increasing capital, if Solvency 2 somehow behaved as you had wished during the pandemic, or if out of the pandemic, you see also changes that are needed in the framework. So let's start with this. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I will try to be brief, but of course there's, you know, so many things to, uh, <laughs> to comment. No, but very briefly on the- Take the time. Don't yeah, so very briefly on the, on the two, uh, on the two uh, uh, comments made and uh, allowing me also to say something about pensions because I focus more on insurance, of course, for good reasons. You know, I, I think what was, what was mentioned by the professor, I think it's, it's quite right. Of course, uh, you know, in the pensions, in occupational pension sector in Europe, uh, we have a much more, uh, you know, uh, I would say national differences uh, uh, matter much more than in insurance also because uh, there is not an harmonization of the regime as we have in solvency too at, uh, at European level. So, you know, the, the, the way that, of course, the regimes are implemented, the way that the fact that uh, the IORP directives are quite high level uh, leaves a lot of uh, room for discretion in the, in the member states. And of course, it leaves also uh, I would say less uh, possibility for a opera to ensure really a consistent, uh, consistent approach. So, even even uh, that's the reality. Uh, you know, our intervention was, uh, I think, important in making sure that the messages that we've sent uh, were appropriate ones. And I think that I'm in there. I'm very happy also because. Uh, you know, what we've seen being done in the different countries on the different pensions uh, sectors by the supervisors, uh, you know, really go uh, along the lines of what we, uh, what we put it in our statements and uh, what we recommended. So I think that that's very important. 
it's also important to mention, of course, the you know the the, the counter cyclical role that uh, pension funds can can and, and and a number of them, of course, performed, because their their liabilities are really truly long uh, long term, and so uh, in that sense they can, of course, uh, have much more this illiquidity uh, uh, within their their books and and to play a counter cyclical role and to go to the markets when the markets are going down. Usually that's what they do. So I I couldn't agree more uh, more with that. Now the, the issue is, of course, uh, where are we going from here in terms of. Uh, pension provision in the EU. And as it was mentioned, of course, the challenge, uh, especially with this uh, interest rate environment, this, the challenge for defined benefit uh, uh, schemes, it's huge. Uh, let's be very honest. You know, nowadays, no company uh, that will put in place a new regime for its, uh, for its staff will think on doing a defined benefit scheme because, of course, uh, it's, it's a too big commitment uh, for the future within this rate environment. So what we're moving more and more, it's of course to more individual solutions, more defined contribution solutions, which also have its own risks because you know if they're not properly managed, they shift the risk to the members, to the citizens. So there is a, of course an, a huge element about uh, you know transparency, uh, the way that, that uh, products are designed, uh, uh, and of course about also the cost effectiveness of, of this. Uh, and that's where the PEP, uh, you know, the Pan European Personal Pension Product, uh, came in. And that's you know the my fight during a number of years, and I'm very happy that finally you know we're close to the end on this, and I'm very proud that uh, you know we could uh, still with the with the crisis uh, you know put out uh, our advice to the Commission on the implementation of the PEP regulation and and also with the regulatory technical standards, focusing on you know a number of elements which are I think fundamental to to uh, to go forward and to minimize and mitigate the problems that we see nowadays in the pension provision in Europe, which is basically about complexity. You know, with the PEP, we have a default uh, product, which has a lot of standardization. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the element of cost effectiveness and cost efficiency. And, uh, you know, there is a cost cap in the PEP. And there is a very clear definition that EOPA made of the commissions that you can take and the limitation on the costs that you can take. Uh, also, of course, uh, to have the PEP as a really, truly long-term uh, pension product. And so the way that uh, this, default, uh, uh, this default product is designed is really to make sure that you will have the possibility to uh, uh, you know, have investment, which will be uh, more a long-term type of investment. So naturally, we will have much more allocation in PEP products to uh, equities, for example. But at the same time, we came in with uh, you know a number of uh, uh, you know mitigation mechanisms to deal with this kind of risk uh, we advocate for the use of stochastic approaches by the the industry to make sure that their investment policies will deliver outcomes within a certain probability of course will deliver outcomes that are good in terms of returns for customers and the, the particularly important thing on pep and this deals with also the you know the, the life insurance uh, talk and the question about solvency too is that the pep in the pep the the guarantees if there are guarantees they are at the end when people retire it's not guarantees during the contract and this changes completely the profile of the liability this makes the liability much more illiquid this allows for much more long-term investment because it avoids the implications on the short-term volatility. And let's be honest, that's not the case with many of the products that are sold nowadays in Europe. And of course, people will like to have everything. We will like to have liquidity and we will like to have better returns. But, you know, uh, as I used to say, when it is too good to be true, it's probably because it's too good to be true. And from my side, and I've been quite uh, you know, strong on this, I want to bring clear, clear uh, communication, information, transparency to the customers. If you want to have a long-term product that will give you the opportunity to have better returns in the future, you need to give away something. What you need to give away is the liquidity in the short term. And that's the reality. And that's the way that I think the PEP should work. And I'm very positive that, uh, you know, uh, that, that this can bring, uh, uh, I would say, a, a different approach to uh, pension provision within the, within the EU. Also, also with the element that, and I can link it to the point that I made about the recovery, also with the element that there is a huge opportunity 
to make the investments, these long-term investments related to the PEP, linked to sustainability, linked to the Green Deal, to really put the Europeans' money to work to the growth of the economy in, in the green economy, in an economy which is much more resilient. So I think that we can have this excellent combination and at the same time also, you know, making use of digital mechanisms to be much more transparent towards customers. You know, we gave uh, an advice which I'm quite proud of it, uh, you know, on the key information document and on the documents that need to be given to, to the consumers, really trying to be, uh, you know, much, uh, transparent and to have a, a document with which people can engage and not just dump information on 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 the citizen so this is i think uh, very important now on the second part uh, uh, on the second uh, um, on the second intervention i couldn't agree more of course there is a there is a real issue uh, in the sector with uh, you know with this environment with this we, we, we used to call it, of course, low for long, but uh, let's be honest, this low, it's not just low, it's negative. And, and that changes completely the picture. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, the paper that it was mentioned that uh, I, I also think it's a good paper and I, we really try to be transparent and clear on the reality. And uh, of course, that links with uh, what we are advocating and what I'm sure will be in our final advice at the end of this year to the Commission, because there is a need to change some of the elements in Solvency 2. And one of them, it's clearly related to this negative interest rate. Um, this was something that when we designed Solvency 2, uh, it was not there. Nobody thought that we could go below zero. Uh, this is a reality right now. It will probably be for many years. So we need to adjust the standard formula to these uh, negative interest rate yields. This will have a cost from a capital perspective. It's clear. We are advocating to have a phase-in process to, for insurers to adapt uh, to get to, to this. And on the other side, we are also, uh, you know, uh, advocating, and this already started before the crisis, but I think the crisis only showed the necessity of that, to make some adjustments in some of the tools that we have to mitigate volatility uh, in order to make sure that, uh, you know, we can have a better outcome for these truly more illiquid type of products that I was talking about, products that are really truly long-term. This is needed, and I think it's very important that, uh, that we take solutions on this. Because uh, you know, if we don't confront the reality, uh, the reality will will come and bite us. And let's be honest. And I think that uh, from a regulatory and supervisory perspective, we need to be clear on uh, clear on this. Thank you. Let me ask you two more questions that have yep. been uh, posed by the our participants. So the first one concerns ratings. So solvency two relies heavily on uh, ratings. And as we know, the COVID crisis may lead to big downgrades in ratings. So we have seen, for example, within the monetary policy framework that somehow there has been a freeze of ratings, at least for some operations, meaning that all those that were investment grades before the crisis would be still be eligible. Mm -hmm. So do you think that in the solvency too, also there is the need of imposing sort of rating freezes or something yeah. like that? Well, as you can imagine, there has been a, you know, a discussion that we had uh, many, many times in the past. And of course, every time that there is you know, a, a crisis, uh, there is something, uh, there, there is uh, again discussions. I think we need to be, uh, we need to be careful with, uh, with that, you know, because if, if we have insurance companies now at the, at the start of the crisis with, with these robust solvency positions, it's because we really tried hard to reflect the best we can the risks that are iner inherent in the investment and in the liability side of insurance. And so, you know, the point of departure needs to be that we should try really to reflect the best we can, the risks. You know, anything that is done to, uh, I would say, uh, go, uh, go out of the, this reality, I think it can start to create other types of problems because let's be honest, it will not give them the right incentives. And on this issue of ratings, you know, we believe that, uh, of course, the, the, the way that the regime is, uh, the re we know that the regime is, of course, focused and uh, based on ratings, that it's not something that, uh, you know, we take uh, uh, as a kind of a decision without, uh, without any uh, analysis and assessment. And the reason is that that is the best that we can use out there as a proxy for the true natural risk. You know, it's impossible uh, to have uh, other type of instruments. We cannot ask uh, the small and medium sized companies to make all their own risk assessment, their own credit assessment of all the investments. So we need to take, uh, of course, what is out there. 
and there are ways in the regime to also mitigate those uh, those situations and of course we are looking it again to see if we need to somehow have some uh, uh, you know some further mitigation of that but i think that by and large the logic of the regime right now in that area is is a good one and let's be honest also on the other side and we have been uh, you know identifying and, uh, and analyzing it very deeply the important thing is, of course, to understand what is the behavior of insurers in face of downgrades, for example. So when you have, uh, you know, uh, when you have the, 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 the bond portfolios, uh, uh, down, downgrades, when you move specially from investment grade to, uh, uh, to non-investment grade, and, and, and to understand is there a cliff effect, uh, you know, in there, uh, and what is the behavior of, uh, of insurers overall, you know. Until now, the assessment that we make is that, you know, usually insurers don't, uh, don't panic, don't have, uh, I would say, uh, an immediate uh, uh, reaction, selling all their, uh, you know, uh, kind of fallen angels, as we, usually, as we usually call it. And this is what we have backed by the evidence in the past. And actually, that's what we are seeing now, even during the crisis. So uh, I think that the regime doesn't impose any kind of cliff effects as we see for example you know uh, and we know that this happens uh, in some of the active uh, asset management side where the funds have by default they need to sell when uh, when they, the, the ratings go down uh, we don't see that in the insurance side and so we don't believe that there will be I would say critical financial stability elements uh, in relation to the behavior of insurers on the credit risk side well, of course, we will have to see how many of these of foreign angels eventually exactly. there will be. So exactly. yeah, exactly. probably it's a bit and, uh, too early you, to, to say now. Yeah, and you may believe that we have done uh, a lot of different scenarios, of course, on that. <laughs> I can imagine. Let me go to another topic. And maybe then uh, if we have, but I see that we have only five minutes left, which is the issue of dividend restrictions. Yeah. So we have had a whole webinar on the issue of uh, dividend restriction for banks and in general following the ESRB also recommendation on this issue. So for banks, there, is, there are two debates. The first one is, first of all, we risk to make the industry uninvestable. So is this a similar risk in the insurance sector? First question. Second question, as uh, one of participants stresses, we have seen that many of the smaller countries, in particular in Eastern Europe, have followed in somehow imposing also restriction to infra-group dividend payments, yeah. which of course has a big impact on bigger groups and also somehow is against, if you want, a capital market union or an integrated market. So how do you see this? Well, there, as you can imagine, these were also, uh, you know, very much difficult discussions on the insurance side also. And of course, there are some differences in relation to the to banks because of the business model, but by and large, as I mentioned before, you know, the situation is similar because we wanted to make sure, of course, that the insurance sector remained, you know, well capitalized, that there is a robust uh, basis of capital to avoid that companies need to take, uh, you know, uh, procyclical decisions. And that I think it's very important, you know, just linking it with the, with the previous element. An insurer that has a robust capital position will definitely uh, not uh, be in a situation that needs to sell fallen agents, for example. They can withstand this and can, uh, of course, continue uh, holding these assets. And ensure that as a weak position, a weaker position, probably will need to do something to manage in the short term their capital position. So I think that this is the concern also from a macro perspective. Now, uh, what we have discussed, and it's part of our statement, uh, you know, early April uh, as part of AOPA, and, and it's, I think it's important to understand this. You know, we're not saying that uh, that solvency two uh, and that the, the the requirements in solvency two doesn't matter anymore. No, you know, we said on the contrary, we said that this makes a lot of sense. I think that the regime is capable of dealing with the current situation. The problem is the uncertainty, and the uncertainty is something that, uh, as I mentioned in my intervention. I think is not yet out of uh, out of the discussion. And so let's be honest, uh, we don't know still what will come in terms of the economic impacts. And we may be the case that we are, you know, in something that goes beyond this uh, 99.5 confidence interval uh, uh, that uh, takes into account, of course, all diversifications between risks, etc. So I think it's prudent to, to say, uh, you know, please suspend temporarily. And I think that's very important to mention. What we're saying is that don't, don't distribute the dividend. No, what we're saying is 
temporarily suspend the distribution. If things go, of course, in the right direction, if the economy will go in a shape of recovery that uh, we all hope, fine, you will distribute it later, no problem. But I think it is, it is really an important element to preserve this capital in the, in the regime. This, does this make companies un, uninvestable? I don't think so, to be very honest. You know, we analyze very thoroughly what were the market reactions to the different uh, you know, positions in terms of dividend, dividend distribution by the big insurers in Europe. And of course, there were some differences because there were still some differences, of course, out there, as I mentioned. But at the end of the day, I think that the penalization uh, or you know, what happened to uh, the, the market capitalization of insurers was by and large, you know, quite similar. So I don't see really in here an issue that companies become an in, uninvestable. Intergroup, uh, intergroup uh, uh, dividend distribution. You're quite right. That's an important element. And actually, you know, we included in our statement back in the beginning of April, a sentence on this. And we said very clearly that, you know, if we see the intergroup issue as an important one, if of course subsidiaries uh, uh, with the crisis started to be in a position that where there are weaker solvency and other capital problems, it will be important to preserve the capital in there. But that's a, a concrete situation. Beyond that, you should uh, have the flow of uh, dividends intra-group because we are in an internal market. That is very clear. And so uh, I think that this is later on the position also that it was put it in the SRB, in the SRB recommendation. And we believe that, of course, that, uh, within a truly internal market, these things should flow. And of course, if you have a company, a subsidiary that needs the support uh, from, the, from the group because of the specific situation, then it makes sense, of course, to preserve the capital at the, at the local level. And I think that this is something which is not solved. And as I mentioned, I think that we need to take a lesson from the crisis because what I didn't like, to be very honest, is the situation where we don't have as the SSM has in the banking sector, the power to have all these discussions because you know it, they had all those discussions also, but at the end, when they take a decision, this is enforceable. And in our case, we took a decision and it's not enforceable. And that I think it creates a problem. I think those doubts about how this is enforceable, different uh, positions by different member states, that's I think something that creates more uncertainty uh, and that is not needed in a time of crisis. Huh? Actually, on this, if I may, just the last word, uh, there was a participant asking indeed whether, of course, Ethiopia suffers from the lack of uh, a stronger implementation regime and whether, you see, whether there would be any hope or any discussion at the moment to create something similar to the single supervisory mechanism. Well, there is, that is eminently a political discussion and a political decision, you know. Of course, uh, you know, I've got my personal views and I think I've been very clear on this along the years and uh, I will continue, of course, to make sure to, that, uh, that I'm clear and transparent on this. I think crises uh, usually help to make changes and make movements. And I think that this should be at the table, you know, together with other elements that we have been pushing uh, for a long time, like uh, having a proper European recovery and resolution regime uh, with powers for coordination to AOPA also, having uh, uh, mechanisms of insurance guarantee schemes throughout Europe to deal with situations like the one that we're dealing right now. So I think that we need to complete the Solvency II framework also with these elements. And we should have, uh, and the crisis should prompt us to have a more European integrated approach also in insurance. And, you know, looking at, for example, the PEP, you know, it's a European product. Hopefully it will be a European label that European citizens will trust. This should be supervised at European level. We shouldn't have a situation where AOP has only the coordination role of, of supervision of national authorities. So I think this is time, as uh, I think President von der Leyen says, said today, this is time for us to take decisions as European states and believing that when we work together and when we have strong European institutions, this is for the benefit of all of us. This is for the benefit of Europe. This is for the benefit of having a Europe that is more efficient, more effective, and a Europe in which citizens can believe and not uh, to be played as a game between member states. Uh, I hope that uh, these things can also help, that this crisis can help us, all of us to, to go forward. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that given the time that we have reached, we have to stop. I'm sorry not to have brought into the discussion the two commentators anymore. We still have 
lots of questions that have been asked both before the seminar and in the seminar. We will pass them on to you, yep. to you all. And if you would like, I mean, now I'm mean, making suggestions we have never done, but if you like, and here I'm talking also to Claire, who is connected, if you are willing to write a written response, we could also post it on the web yep. so that the participants could actually see the responses to, yep. to the questions you think yep. you want to address. We'll take a yeah. look. Okay. So thank you very much again for, to all the three speakers for being with us today and the participants, and we look forward to the next event together. Thank you very much, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye.